Good evening and welcome to Medicine in Our Backyard. This series is presented by the Newport Beach Public Library Foundation in, found in partnership with UCI Health. I am Adrian Windsor, a board member of the foundation. We would like to thank our generous benefactors, Mike and Polly Smith. They have sponsored and supported this program since its inception about eight years ago. We want you to know that the foundation is alive and well as we enter this post-pandemic season. We have in-person programs beginning this month, It's Your Money and the Book Discussion Group. Our library live and witty lectures will be back in person. So if you are a member of the foundation, thank you. If you are not, we hope you'll consider join us. Our program today will conclude with Q&A. So we request that you hold all of your questions until the end of the lecture. Please use the Q&A box to ask any questions instead of the chat box. I am pleased to introduce our speaker, Dean Bowden Albala. Dr. Bernadette Bowden Albala is the director and founding dean of the program in public health. She is a social epidemiologist and professor of population health and disease prevention, as well as a professor in the Department of Epidemiology and Neurology at the UCI School of Medicine and the Susan and Henry Samueli College of Health Sciences at the University of California, Irvine. Dr. Bowden Abala received her PhD and MPH from Columbia University School of Public Health in sociomedical science tropical medicine and epidemiology. She speaks to us tonight about the Delta variant and other COVID challenges. She will discuss what we need to fear, the challenges ahead of us and what we expect moving forward. Welcome Dean Bowden Albala. Thank you very much. I'm gonna share these slides and hope that everyone can see them. So just bear with me. Um, okay, very good. I think we're ready. And it's really a pleasure for me to be here and talk to you. And I'm, I'm excited always by um, questions. And so I look forward to um, some more iterative discussion after I um, go through my slides. So the first thing I wanted to uh, talk a little bit about is um, Adrian mentioned, I am the Dean of, um, founding Dean of a program in public health. We are moving from a program to a school. We have 1300 undergraduates who are getting a degree in public health and a couple of hundred graduate students uh, who are getting either a master's in public health, which is the um, professional degree in public health um, or a PhD in public health and our mission, our vision and our values are around um, evidence-based science, social determinants of health and health equity. Um, and I wanted to just talk a little bit We've been involved in this COVID crisis here in Orange County, in the state of California, and um, across the nation since it started. We, um, as a school or as a, as a in, in transition to a school, um, our faculty have taken on leadership roles um, in the equity driven vaccine task force, ta task force around the county and in uh, on the state. Uh, taken on advisory roles and have worked to advocate for uh, slowing transmission, for policies to assure that we all remain healthy and safe, and of course, uh, for equitable distribution of vaccines. And we'll be talking about that for boosters um, as well. And um, we participated in a number of initiatives adding to the science around what we know about COVID, not just here in Orange County, but also um, nationwide. We uh, were the first, I think really the first group across the state and definitely across the country to put together something called a health equity contact tracing workshop where we worked with the county to train um, their, their folks to do contact tracing. 
We have stood up for our large campus of 50,000, both uh, about 36,000 undergraduate, uh, 36,000 students, and uh, a, and then another um, 14,000 faculty and staff. We have stood up our own contact tracing. Um, uh, workforce, and we also have been working with different uh, cities and towns across Orange County. Um, we were the first to look at um, surveillance in the county, COVID surveillance early, and then worked with Santa Ana Cares last December to look at um, the prevalence of COVID in that community that was heavily burdened with COVID um, and are now working on improving health literacy and resource access among the most vulnerable populations in Orange County. So just to give you a sense of what public health does in a pandemic, and these are all things that we've been um, honored to be working with the county and others uh, to be part of. So where are we now? And we are just in this very interesting place in the pandemic. It's hard to believe it's been you know, over 18 months since this pandemic uh, started. And as we all know, uh, we had this California state mask off policy effective June 15th of 2021. Um, you know, up until that time, people were really wearing their masks outside and inside, certainly when there were a lot of other folks around. And so masks have a huge amount of protection. And so once we went masks off, and I know that we're, we're in a recommended mask state now, but once we went in June masks off, we really um, uh, sort of opened ourselves up, even though we were vaccinated, to more disease transmission. And I, I want us to think about, we are at this sort of junction of multiple things happening at the same time, which is why we've seen this um, accelerated transmission of Delta and we'll go through it. So we masks off. The second thing that that's happened, um, started to happen by the end of the summer is that it looks like we're seeing this waning immunity. And so I think most of us were vaccinated early in um, January, February, uh, you know, and um, during that time, we were seeing this sort of alpha, uh, the original COVID, if you will, or a little bit of a variant from that. And um, so the vaccines, the Pfizer and Moderna especially, were really very protective. 91% efficacy in, in terms of reducing risk of hospitalization, uh, ventilation, and death. And those are still outstanding numbers that we see even now with Delta. But we're seeing a lot more transmission. We're seeing a lot more. Delta is a variant. It's changed. It is more highly transmissible. And we're also seeing this transition back to school. So all of this to say that a lot of different things, a lot of variables, around transmission changed in a very short period of time. Um, and this Delta variant enters in at that same time. And of course, increased transmissibility, Delta representing 99% now of all US COVID-19 cases. It is highly transmissible, more than two times as contagious as previous variants. And as of, as of the end of August, again, it accounted for almost 100% of all US COVID cases. Same here in Orange County. Uh, we know, because I think we've all now known of people, fully vaccinated folks that's fully vaccinated with Moderna, with Pfizer, or, or with J&J, um, can have breakthrough infections, and there is the possibility of spreading the virus, that secondary transmission. Although most viral spread, we believe, is still spread through unvaccinated folks. Um, and of course, the greatest risk of transmission and the greatest risk of serious illness is among those that are not vaccinated. And so even though we are vaccinated, there's this layered prevention strategy, in other words, masks and other things that are still needed to reduce transmission. And of course, we will talk about, don't worry, um, boosters and um, how boosters can help and what are some of the issues around boosters. And just to, just to really try to 
uh, have you all understand, again, Delta by the numbers. We talked about this a little, Moderna and Pfizer having 91% efficacy against serious illness and death, and that is critical. Um, but uh, uh, and Moderna and Pfizer are only somewhere between 61 and 72% efficacious against Delta in terms of mild illness. And so while all of these vaccines really re significantly reduce risk of death and hospitalization and serious, serious uh, COVID illness, um, Delta it uh, is not, uh, there's not as much efficacy in those vaccines against contracting and um, Delta. And, and e even though that, that the, the breakthrough will be mild or most likely mild. And again, we talked about this waning immunity added to, so we have a new variant. We have a vaccine that was very protective against the first alpha um, COVID. It's a little bit less efficacious against getting the disease or transmitting the disease because of Delta. And now then we have waning immunity, which could indeed in some studies reduce the efficacy um, of getting mild illness and being able to transmit the disease to as low as 40 to 50%. And you can see these things are working there. Um, and, and then the other uh, thing that we've all been hearing and talking about is herd immunity. You know, we're still at about 60 some odd percent of, of folks that we're gonna come in contact with um, in here in Orange County are vaccinated. We don't, children are not vaccinated because they can't be vaccinated yet. And I think we're waiting in, in, in tremendous anticipation. It's my belief as an epidemiologist that we're not gonna be fully out of um, COVID until we really get our kids vaccinated. Um, and, um, and so, you know, we really would need adults all adults, we need 90 plus percent of adults to be vaccinated before we can think about herd immunity if we're not vaccinating children. And again, I'm happy to answer questions about this. So boosters, wow, we've had a lot going on in the last, I gave a talk like this a couple of weeks ago and the, the verdict on boosters wasn't out, the verdict is out now. And so you can, we have um, FDA authorization of a booster for Pfizer. That booster is individuals for individuals over 65, um, individuals with between 18 and 64 um, with a high risk of severe COVID and so all of these other immunological um, issues um, and then individuals 18 to 64 with a high risk of COVID due to certain kinds of institutional and occupational exposure and the CDC is just as of the 27th really defined that as, um, as teachers now, as healthcare workers, as um, grocery and other essential workers. And so and the Food and Drug Administration approves this booster for Pfizer, although they're giving both Pfizer and Moderna out, and we can talk about that. Um, uh, they approve that. The CDC pulls back a little bit and says, we really want boosters to be in our, um, in our folks over 65, in folks who really have other high risk asthma, obesity, certain other um, cancer, certain other medical conditions. Um, and then, um, and then the, there, there's a few other groups that review this. And now it looks like we're settling back at these, um, these criteria, which include folks who are also at institutional and occupational exposure. And I will say that unlike the mass vaccine um, areas that the county had put up, stepped up for our initial vaccines, we are much more likely to be able to access boosters at local pharmacies and through local health systems. The other thing I will say is, the most important thing that we can do and continue to do is get everybody vaccinated that is not vaccinated, but is eligible to be vaccinated. We will really be in the best shape when everybody gets vaccinated. Um, and then, you know, there are other variants. We need everyone vaccinated because when we have 30 to 40% of a population not vaccinated, 
we are still going to be able to, to have variants arise. And we have this new mu variant, it's of interest, but it seems to be less concerning than Delta seems to be less transmissible than Delta. That's the big issue with Delta, you know, much high, more highly transmissible. The science is still evolving. There may be other variants out there until we can really get almost everybody vaccinated. Uh, the science continues to evolve. The science has been evolving since day one, and, and it's very, very difficult for everyone to understand from day to day the science and to get that straight. And I think that's been a real frustration with this, um, with this uh, epidemic or this pandemic. Um, and then again, 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 the importance of vaccination. I can't say it enough. Vaccination, vaccination, vaccination. We probably wouldn't even need boosters to the extent that we do need them now if we really had good vaccine coverage because we'd stop, we'd stop variant um, a development and we would stop transmission of disease. So how to get through Delta, and I, I shouldn't say how to live through Delta. If you're vaccinated, you, you're, you, will live through, you will live through Delta. I worry about those that are not vaccinated because, because they are at much higher risk of serious disease and death. Um, so we need to continue to follow the CDC guidelines. We need to vaccinate and be vigilant about, and that's the most important thing. And so we are not back to, we are not normal. It is not normal. And I know that when we all got our vaccine, our second vaccines of Moderna or, or Pfizer, or when we got our J&J, &J, we all said, ah, finally, finally, I can travel, I can do this, I can do that. And yes, I think we can do so much more, but we still have to be vigilant. We need to understand always what the positivity rates in the communities that we live in and that we travel to. So I'm not saying don't travel, but don't travel to a place that is high risk. Stay in low risk communities. You are much less likely to have a breakthrough or get get uh, encounter Delta or whatever else is there if you are in an area with low positivity. Um, consider that we are still in a, transi a transitional period, that we're not gonna go back fully to normal. We really do need to be wearing masks indoors, especially if we're still in high risk areas. We need to take measured approaches to seeing friends and relatives, knowing that people, I've seen invitations now, you know, those not vaccinated don't come. Um, you know, we need to make sure, but again, we know that we have some breakthrough. So careful, small groups, measured approach, we really should continue to avoid indoor spaces if we can. If we are not, I'm going to, when I go to work every day, I'm wearing a mask the whole day. And when you have a choice, choose outdoors. We're so lucky that we live in such a wonderful area that we have so many things. I know it's cold today, but so many, so many wonderful outdoor venues that we can, um, that we can still go to. Um, and as we are heading into the fall and winter, you know, get vaccinated for the flu and get a booster if you meet a booster, if you meet criteria to get a booster. Um, we talked a little bit about the, the vaccine situation, pediatric vaccines. I've heard that we're, we're hoping for vaccines to have been reviewed and EUA approval by the Food and Drug Administration, hopefully right around um, Halloween, because children are as likely as adults to contract COVID-19. We, in our Santa Ana study, we found last December, the prevalence of antibodies among adults was 30% in Santa Ana. The prevalence among children was 30%. There was no difference. Um, and so this demonstrates the needs for, for pediatric vaccines. And I've been very vocal about saying we should have had that pediatric vaccine out there now for our children. We shouldn't be waiting all of these months and months that we needed to have started those trials basically at the same time we started them for adults. We have always done a lot of work in vaccines for children. I don't understand why we waited and it's, you know, we let our children down because our children are now in school and they're getting tested and they're wearing masks and they have to be vigilant, uh, very vigilant. And um, I really wish that that we had them vaccinated, but hopefully soon. And Pfizer vaccine does show promising results, but again, has to go through an expert um, review committee. We don't want to give out something that's not going to work, um, but I'm, I'm, I'm hearing very good things. 
Um, and so our challenge is going forward again, reaching herd immunity. We're not gonna be able to fully reach herd immunity unless we were really, really beefed up the number of um, uh, vaccinations for our, um, for our adults and we get our kids vaccinated. We still have significant vaccine hesitancy out there. And we really, as public health, as public health officials, I, a uh, public health professional, I work with my, with all of my faculty and my students to really try to address some of the issues around vaccine hesitancy. People are still hesitant. I was at um, CVS pharmacy the other day, just picking up medication. There was a whole line of people that hadn't been vaccinated and they were finally going to get vaccinated. So the good news is that people are still converting from hesitant to being vaccinated, but we really still need to make sure that we can answer everyone's questions about vaccine hesitancy and get them converted because everyone that becomes vaccinated is one less uh, person that's going to, you know, be at risk of, of death or severe illness, uh, be at risk of, um, you know, potentially converting to a uh, converting to another variant, and also, um, you know, we need that herd immunity. And so, each individual that gets vaccinated now contributes to our sort of ongoing quest for real vaccine coverage. Um, we have people that are very much resistant to vaccines. Um, and I, I'm really trying to find ways to address and work with those folks that, that have unfortunately politicized um, what is really good science. Um, and then we still have people that don't have access. And you think, how can that possibly be? But there are people that are working multiple jobs. There are people that um, you know don't get breaks, that don't know where to go. And so um, we all need to be ambassadors of good information about vaccines and vaccine access. Um, there's a lot of discussion about global vaccine resources and equitable distribution of resources. The truth is that we actually need everybody across the globe vaccinated to finally end COVID. And we are nowhere near there. And there's a lot of controversy even about boosters um, and getting a booster versus you know, making sure that folks are vaccinated in other countries around the world because you know in this day and age when we can travel basically around the world in one day viruses and bacteria and many many diseases can travel that same way so ultimately we're not going to be able to address this covid problem without um without really vaccinating everyone um and so i i guess i would say you know, that we are in a situation where we have this highly transmissible variant. If you are eligible for um, a booster, you should go and get a booster. Um, and at the same time, we have a number of drug companies that are, you know, getting vaccines out there. And we need to make sure that we are getting vaccines out across the globe to everybody who needs a vaccine. Um, and then, you know, and, and then hopefully we'll stop the variants and we may not need as many boosters and uh, we can get back to something more normal. Um, that we need to make sure that we have clear public health messaging out there, that we still need to continue to wear masks and we still need to ourselves social distance. And we, we I feel as a public health um, leader that we have to do a better job. We somehow lost our ability to communicate about scientific processes um, with lay audiences, specifically vaccine development. Um, and then just to understand that we are rapidly evolving in terms of science around viruses and vaccines. And this is exciting because we're, we're closer to getting things right, but we're still moving and learning at the same time, building the plane as we fly it, some people will say. So the other thing that I, I must mention, you know, looking back and moving forward and recovery and resiliency, what has happened to all of us in the last 18 months has been extremely traumatic. And um, there's a lot of folks that are suffering from depression and anxiety. 
Um, I know that we, um, we just started back on campus and sort of a, a hybrid to in-person mode. And so we have a lot of students on campus and our students are much more stressed than we've seen them before. They're much more anxious. And I know from my faculty and staff that we see the same thing. Um, and so we need to give ourselves a break. We need to allow ourselves time to grieve 18 months of loss. We lost moments that we'll never get back. We lost people. I, I, um, I have a friend that lost five members of her family. Um, and so we are in this time of healing and we need to continue to work together to really get through this. And one of the things that you can all do is when you see a friend or family member that's really, really having a hard time, you know, to let them know that you're supportive of them and to also encourage them to go and seek resources. There's a lot of people out there that, um, that we can help. And there's a lot of people out there who have the, who, who are great resources for helping us to get through this. This is um, a time that none of us, none of us will ever forget. So I'm just gonna end this and then start asking, uh, so start to have some, we can talk about some questions, you know, how can you help public health? So we're new and um, we are really um, engaging throughout Orange County. Um, so you can help by supporting public health research, um, supporting the next generation of public health leaders if you're interested in, in helping us being on our boards or helping us in any way, um, sharing accurate health information and of course staying uh, safe and healthy. And um, so I'm gonna turn this over uh, for questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dean, that was great. Uh, we have quite a few questions. I'm gonna start with one of on my own. You're so zealous about public health. What motivated you to come into this field? Oh, wow. Um, so that's a great question. I was actually very interested in um, doing work in sort of clinical medicine and uh, was doing um, some really interesting work in um, cardiovascular disease, but, but from a bench scientist point of view. And um, I ended up getting involved in the, the last big epidemic. Anyone know what that was? Um, HIV and AIDS. And uh, I got involved and never looked back and moved from clinical medicine and bench science into public health. And, you know, uh, it's all about us. You know, we as a society, we shape the way in which diseases are experienced. And you can definitely see that. You could see that during HIV and AIDS. You can see that now during um, COVID. Okay, great. Well, thank you. We have a question about people who have chronic lack of enough sleep. Does that have an effect on, on the vaccine's effectiveness? Well, I can tell you, I don't think there's any studies about um, sleep deprivation and vaccine effectiveness per se, but I can say that there's a huge literature. And in fact, we, our team has contributed to some of that literature around um, how sleep deprivation is a major risk factor for cardiovascular disease and stroke. And we know that people who have other risk factors for cardiovascular disease and stroke, including obesity, diabetes, hypertension, that they were at significantly high risk of having serious illness um, associated with COVID. Okay, well, that's good to know then. So people who have sleep problems really need to pay attention. They need to pay attention. They need to speak to their physicians. They need to be vaccinated because they are at increased risk. People who have sleep deprivation often have hypertension happening in the middle of the night um, and, and have other uh, metabolic uh, risk factors. And so definitely need to be under the direction of a physician. Thank you. Uh, we have a question here about, will there be any difference between the boost that you get if you had the vaccine five and a half months ago instead of six months ago? 
So we really, uh, you really want to let the vaccines work in terms of boosting your immunity. And so right now the recommendation is really a vac to get a booster if you meet the other criteria for booster after six months. And that would be after your last, remember from Moderna and Pfizer, that was two different, um, two different shots. And so you really want six months after that. Some people have said seven months and eight months. I've seen some of the data that looked at large groups of, uh, they followed healthcare workers for over a period of time. Basically, if, if healthcare workers got vaccinated in December, um, right, it's then, and, and your second vaccine was in January, you're just about eight months now. And what we really start to see is the vaccine holding up really well um, at, you know, four months, five months, six months, seven months, but at about seven to eight months, you start to see this decrease, uh, this decline in some of um, uh, the, you know, the antibody, um, it, it just in some of the antibody numbers. And so, so um, that's where we're getting this six plus month number from. We have always talked about boosters. It was always something we discussed, you know, sometimes, I mean, early on in this, in, in sort of the vaccine, early on in the vaccine development period, we thought about boosters the same way that we get our annual flu vaccines, which by the way, everybody should make sure they get. Um, and then I think the, it was hope, we were hoping that we would really still have good protection for a year to 18 months. And so the, the boosters coming this early, uh, you know, again, I think more of it because of Delta, um, that's, that's a lot, that's, that's really early for a booster, but, um, but because of Delta, we have to really be cautious and we have to get that our immune system up again. So when will the Moderna booster be available? So, so the Moderna booster, so this, that's a great question. And there's, there's the practicality of what's happening. And then, there, then there's the Food and Drug Administration, right? So Pfizer applied to the Food and Drug Administration. It produced evidence based upon its, um, its studies uh, saying that the um, in, that we see that the um, immune system is waning uh, when it comes to Pfizer uh, vaccination at about seven plus months, and so a third, basically this a booster, which is the same vaccine for the third time, brings those numbers back up, and the Food and Drug Administration says, okay, we've approved it. Uh, Moderna will do the same thing, but we, they have not approved it. The thing is that um, the Moderna and the Pfizer are basically the same vaccination, vaccine type. And so we know that pharmacies are giving out both Pfizer and Moderna as boosters right now. So practically people can get either Pfizer or Moderna what is legally approved by the Food and Drug Administration right now is Pfizer. Okay, because we have a question asking, if you've had Pfizer, can you get a Moderna booster? If you've had Moderna, can you get a Pfizer booster? Yes, yeah, so, so the, basically the, the conversation in, in the health field is yes, because they're both messenger RNA vaccines. And so, you know, uh, the J&J &J was a little bit different vaccine, um, and so we're waiting to hear what the vaccine experts say about that. I think they'll say another booster, Moderna, Pfizer is fine, but we haven't heard from them yet. So that's where we are. And I have to say, you know, Adrian, it's very confusing. Don't feel bad if, if, you, if folks are, are, are not are, are a little confused about what's happening because you know it's unprecedented the timing of all of this and um, and and what's coming out and what's happening. Um, it's it's okay to constantly ask questions. Okay, that's that's good to know. Now um, there's a question here. Do you recommend getting the booster if you have adequate antibodies after an antibody test? 
Yeah, so that's a great question. And um, the answer is what, you know, different people will say what is adequate antibodies after an antibody test. It turns out to add to the confusion, there's a lot of different kinds of antibody tests for COVID out there. There are antibody tests that have 10, that measure 10 plus antibodies. Those are great tests, but they're not really out there as much for public use. There are then the other antibody tests that only measure a couple. So I, I would say you have to decide if you, are, if you are low risk and really not eligible for a booster, and if you have adequate antibodies as, as, as per your physician, then, then probably it's not worth um, you know, getting the booster at this point. You might be able to wait longer. So are people having reactions to the booster? Are you hearing? Not hearing anything different than, um, than the first time people got, um, the first or second time people got injected, you know, some soreness at, um, at the injection site and, you know, people, the, the clinicians say to rub that site, you know, rub the site so that you don't get that sort of knot. But no, nothing, no, I've heard of nothing uh, different than first or second um, injections. Okay. Well, I think we're all kind of maybe stunned by the transmissibility of this Delta variant and also by the, the fact that the, 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 the original vaccine wears down, wears off. I mean, not off, but partial. Yeah, so I think that um, a couple of things, right. So we've got this partial waning and you know we don't know exactly if everybody is waning, if it's more about exposure. There's a lot of questions that are left unanswered. Remember that um, this vac these vaccines were really made for what was the original COVID virus. I think they, to your point, there wasn't, a, there wasn't um, an expectation that there would be such a variant that would, would really heavily, heavily transmit. And so in the, in the old days of 18 months ago, when COVID was just early starting, if you, if, if you were in a room and nobody had any immunity towards COVID and you had COVID, you would likely infect about two people, okay, in a room. Now, with Delta, that, could, that number could be eight. And each of those eight would infect eight. And so, I mean, I've seen numbers anywhere from five to eight. That's a, that's, that's a huge difference in how quickly this gets spread. And so, and again, just back to, we were wearing masks essentially for 18 months. So even after we had uh, been vaccinated, we were still wearing our masks, right? And so, and we didn't have the Delta variant here. So we, we had lower transmissibility because the, the initial COVID virus really didn't infect as many people as quickly. And we were wearing masks, which people say can stop transmission by 50 to 70%. And we were vaccinated and we were really careful, right? We were really socially distanced. How many people wore, ma wore not only masks, but wore gloves at the grocery store? They were scrubbing everything down with the carts in the grocery store. So we were in this best case scenario. Schools were closed. We were working at home. And then to my point earlier, in June, we open up everything. We take off our masks so, and only half of us were vaccinated. Delta comes into the country and, um, and, and at the same time, you know, so, and then, so highly transmissible and our immune system starts to wane and we get these breakthrough cases. So, um, you know, nobody expected that, but that's what, that's what's happened. Um, and I think what, what we, and we remember last year at the same time in August into September, we had that surge. This is a virus that, you know, ebbs and flows. It's had happened from the, from the very beginning. So I guess the next question, I know someone's probably asked it, but I'll answer right now. 
is that we pro we do expect, given we, if we don't get the kids vaccinated and we don't increase the vaccination rates among adults, we do expect another surge of COVID, Delta or something else, November to December. And we are mixing and mingling much more. So we've got throw in flu there too. And the initial symptoms of flu and COVID are very much the same. So um, we, we really need to get everybody vaccinated as quickly as possible and continue to be vigilant because we're not out of the woods yet. Well, I heard you recommending that we follow many of the same precautions we were following before. Yes, yes. And I know that a lot of people who um, are vaccinated say, hey, this isn't really fair. And, you know, we got vaccinated and now we're back to the same. And we're, we're back to the same place because we because almost half the population is still not vaccinated. Had we vaccinated, had we really gotten uh, hold of uh, and good coverage by what I think the governor wanted, right? mid-June, we would probably not be in this bad Delta transmission period. Wow. I have a question here about the J&J &J vaccine. Yeah. Uh, are they coming out with a booster or what is it? I, I haven't, I, you know what, I think they will. I think they're, they're still waiting and testing. It's all, it, you know, it's all about um, all the folks that had been vaccinated with J and J, Moderna, Pfizer, that they that they're following them, um, and they're doing some more testing and trials. And once they get a long enough follow up with a large enough number of people, then they can go and file. Yes, I'm certain that uh, J and J is uh, is is working on um, what their booster will be like. Good. Um we have someone here who wants to know if you can share some data, academically speaking, about the side effects of the vaccine. Yeah, wow. I mean, Susan Wong is, is better than this than I am at this. So we know we know that there is mild myocarditis, right? Um, which is an inflammation of the heart that is very rare, but is associated, has been shown to be associated. Um, with the vaccine, but again, uh, very, very rare. Um, others, others, the other big side effects were are really much more associated with, um, you know, feeling flu-like and achy about 24 hours after um, the injection. Um, some folks really felt it more in their second dose than their first dose. Uh, I haven't heard people feeling worse in the third dose or booster at all. Um, and so, um, you know, redness and localized swelling in the area, um, headache, again, most of the side effects. Now, there are some folks that have severe allergies to um, the type, uh, you know, that have severe allergies and basically, you know, are carrying around EpiPens and are allergic to almost everything. Um, those folks need to work with their physicians um, and, and get vaccinated, but again, on, only under the supervision of their physicians. There are things, there's a protocol that a lot of people are working with their physicians on. And so that really is under, again, medical clinical guidance. You know, all vaccines have side effects, um, you know, and uh, so if you get yellow fever vaccine, something I'm a global traveler that, um, that and which is a live vaccine that, you know, there are, there are significant side effects, mostly again, early side effects, not feeling well, fever, et cetera. But, you know, the, the vast benefits of these vaccines far outweigh what are, is most of the time sort of, uh, you know, nuisances. In fact, I know that we were so concerned initially um, with the messenger RNA vaccines that people were really going to feel achy, especially after the second vaccine, that a lot of employers said, you know, you can just take that 
you're not feeling well, we, we get it, take that day off. And in the healthcare setting, we actually prepared with extra staff, et cetera, but we really did not see that. We really did not see that. All right, now this is the last question I have from our participants and, and we're, it's a question about when will we get back to normal? Because we thought that this fall we would and now it looks like we backpedaled. <clears throat> so do you have any idea when normalcy will really be restored? Yeah, I think that, so I think we, there are a couple, the, the road to, to normalcy or normalcy um, is one that has to include um, getting our children vaccinated. Because our children here in Orange County, for example, almost one third of our population is children. And so they continue to get COVID and, uh, and spread disease, okay? I mean, you know, and that's one group. And then we have of adults, somewhere between 30 and, and close to 40% of adults not vaccinated. So we are, what, what I, those that are vaccinated, I know. And remember at the beginning, everybody wanted to get vaccinated. It seemed like everybody did and you couldn't get it. It took you months to, or weeks to get on appointment. So we were going under the belief that everyone would want to be vaccinated to protect themselves and their communities. And so we would, and had that been the case, we probably would not have had Delta. We probably would have had 90 plus percent coverage. We probably wouldn't even be needing boosters, be a booster shot this quickly because we wouldn't have had such an aggressive variant that Delta has turned out to be in terms of transmissibility. We probably wouldn't have had such breakthrough. So, so we would have been back a little bit closer to, to normalcy, but we're not, so we'll, we'll be in stages. We'll, they, once, we, once kids get vaccinated, we'll be a step closer. Once we get more adults vaccinated, a step closer. And then as I alluded to in one of my earlier slides, we still have to, we still have uh, global uh, issues of vaccination. Now, you know, a lot of the European countries, the UK, the US, Canada, uh, you know, uh, their rates are actually better than the US. We're, we're falling behind now. We're really lagging behind in terms of adult covered. But, you know, in, in places that I do a lot of work in like West Africa, you know, we, the, the vaccines are really not, um, available. I do think, again, when kids get vaccinated across the world, because it's actually, it, it's, it's always been a target to vaccinate younger kids. And once we get approval, we may end up expediting normalcy if we can get these kids vaccinated. Um, but that's, that is one thing. So there's, there's sort of normalcy, you mean, not wearing masks indoors. That's, we're gonna need all of those other folks vaccinated. Um, but then the second part of normalcy again is um, big groups, how big is big? How, how big do we feel comfortable taking our mask off? And then, then you know, mental health, because I think again, we, we plenty of people lost jobs. Um, and so I guess it depends upon how you define normalcy. Um, there's, it's, you know, we have now think about tiered risk levels for, for travel. I don't know about um, any of you, but I, I'm a big traveler and love to travel and have had, even after I've been vaccinated, have had a lot of difficulty in, in making decisions about where to travel, where we would be safe. The cruise industry, you know, hasn't gotten back to normal. So I don't know. I think it's going to be. I think we. I think we just have to take this step by step, and you know, be vaccinated and be vigilant and make good decisions about going to areas that are uh, lower risk and doing things. So we don't have to stay in our houses anymore, but doing things that are lower risk. That that to me is really the the way back to normalcy. 
Wow. Well, thank you. This has been so informative and I hope it helps all the people out there in our audience. Uh, I know we have many people in our audiences who are over 65. So let's go get our booster shots. That's, that's really the critical part of it and urge everyone you know to get vaccinated. Share this message. We have uh, been recording this. It will be available on the foundation's website on the YouTube on our YouTube channel. So encourage many people to come and listen to what Dean has shared with us today. So we thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. Have a great evening and everybody stay safe and healthy. Yes, and, and let me just say that our next event is Dr. Claire Hinchcliffe. She's the chair of the neurology department. And she's going to be talking about, can we repair the brain, <laughs> the promise of, self, of stem cells? So be with us next time. And thank you for being here tonight.